What is up, folks? Thank you so much for joining this lovely episode 53 of the Emulsion Podcast. I'm your host, Justin Kana. This is a very special interview episode you're about to listen to. And our guest today is Spencer Venancio, a 13-year-old chef out of Minnesota who does pop-up dinners out of his house. He is incredibly interested in the fine dining side of cooking. And like a lot of you guys end up doing, he reached out to me to end up getting a few questions answered. And a few questions turned into several questions, and I started to realize... This could bring a lot of value to everyone, so I figured we'd just make the uh, Q&A a podcast episode, so I get interviewed just as much as Spencer does in this episode. We talk Grant Ackett's and his disappointing meal at Alinea. That was really interesting. How much to charge for a pop-up dinner, expansion strategy, using social media, organizing recipes, staging at Noma. The list goes on and on. He actually just finished his first stage at Spoon and Stable, which is a restaurant in Minneapolis, and he actually used my... Uh, stagiaire email template to get that. So that's a little humble brag there for me. Uh, and we also talk about comparing himself to Flynn McGarry, which uh, probably a lot of you that uh, light clicked off in your brain when I said 13 year old chef. But I really did enjoy this interview. I apologize that Spencer's audio was kind of peaking for a lot of this interview. I did what I could in post to bring it down to a reasonable level. I finally have a solution for my interviews going forward. So these will be pleasant to listen to. He definitely asked a lot of really great questions. He's a really smart kid, driven, definitely still has a lot to learn, but he's got nothing but time to grow and improve. I just think it's crazy that years ago we all laughed at the idea of a chef under the age of 18 doing their own thing, and now we all get to watch Flynn McGarry open his own place in New York City, which is a feat that few chefs ever get to achieve. So a, a huge goal of mine is to help the next generation. They're realizing that the stigmas that you and I grew up with don't always apply, and they're creatively finding ways to get their ideas in front of people. Uh, the questions that he asked, the topics that we covered, it, it was kind of like, have you ever had that moment where you watch a movie and you love it, but your friend is like, hey, I kind of want to watch this movie. And then you're like, yes, 100%, let's watch it. And then you'll happily watch the movie all over again. And on the car ride to the movie, you're like, dude, you're going to be, you're going to love the part when blank, insert blank. That is, that is this phase of my career for me. I am so grateful to be able to help however I can and relive the journey and make sure that you do it better than I did. So I sincerely hope you enjoy my talk with the Spencer Venancio. I'd be curious to know where did it start out for you, right? Because I know for me there was this phase when I was when I was 13, I, there was stuff that I was 100% interested in and what ended up happening was I was kind of left to my own devices. I like whatever my parents were willing to let me do or whatever my friends were doing was okay to do. And then anything else bigger than that outside of kind of my tiny town in the Midwest was off limits, right? But with the internet being a thing, you've gotten an incredible launch on, I mean, I would call it a career. You're, you're, you're on Instagram. You've obviously found me through YouTube. Um, maybe you can tell me a little bit more about how the internet has played a role in your interest in cooking and chefs, especially on the fine dining end of the spectrum. Yeah, definitely. The internet has been extremely beneficial because without the internet, I obviously wouldn't have been able to found, have found people who are doing what I find so interesting and so I would have been like the restaurants in my town are like I don't have any really particularly great restaurants so I would have been like cooking is Applebee's and and McDonald's like that's but right. but, but through the internet I've been able to find that cooking is the French laundry and Alinea and can be these grand things as opposed to just sustenance mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And did it all start on the internet or was there like what can you can you give us a frame of like when did it start because you're 13 now what where, where does the timeline start it probably starts around nine or ten with just the introduction to like food tv which is super like kind of embarrassing and i wish i had like a better story <laughs> but it was through food tv and then that's kind of i kind of looked into it through more like through the internet and i found who are now, like, the people who inspire me most, like, Grant Ackett's and Ferran, and those, and then I was, like, that's the kind of cooking that I want to do, and that's what's, like, really interesting to me. Sure. So, speaking of people who have kind of taken your path, you're obviously uh, aware of Flynn McGarry. You and I have personally touched on, on him before, but a lot of chefs really kind of despised him. He got a lot of hate when he was kind of getting all those articles written about him. 
do you have any opinions or do you, do you have anything to say to people who think that you're too young to be doing what you're doing? Well, right now, the people who really know who I am and what I'm doing, I've been friends and family, so I haven't really experienced the, oh, you're too young. But I mean, I really think that if you know what you're doing and you are passionate about it, that you can do whatever is like, whatever you can do at that point is okay. And so if at this, if at that age he was able to cook in those restaurants, then that is exactly what he should be doing. And the same thing, like, in my opinion, applies to me. Like, if if I have what it takes to cook in those restaurants, and then I think that that's what I should be doing. Like, whatever I can literally be able to do is what I should be doing. 100%. I agree. I can agree with that. How, how, how are your parents responding to all of this? Because I know that they, I mean, you're obviously, <laughs> when I was, doing what I was doing being like trying to be ambitious and going stodging everywhere and doing all these things that I was I I had moved away from home I was in college I was 18 I had access to you know transportation or or, or whatever I had I, I needed to do I cannot I mean my parents I I know my parents would have been 100% supportive if it was something that I wanted to do at, at, at your age but Maybe you can tell me a little bit about how they respond to what you're doing and how they help you. I know that they definitely help you out with the pop-ups that you do. So maybe you can tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, my parents have been nothing but supportive. I mean, it definitely becomes a little bit of a pain doing all the things that they do. Right. Driving driving me to stages at 10 a.m., taking me shopping. I mean, it's just like when we do the pop-ups, it's like probably a week work for them. Mm -hmm. And they have to t- spend a lot of the time just kind of taking me places, which definitely is not easy. I understand that. And so everything that they've done has been super supportive. And are they involved in restaurants at all? Do they have anything in the food business or industry? Um, My dad owned a restaurant in San Francisco, like, before I was born. But it it was, like, not the fine dining. It was an Italian restaurant. Kind of like like pasta and pizza, mm-hmm. so like, and I don't believe it had an impact on my introduction to food or like my love for food, but it could. I just don't I like. I don't see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. If it did, right. And what what is what is pushing you towards the creative cooking? I know you've um, we've talked before about kind of like the service aspect is something that you really enjoy, but what, what is prevent, like you could, you could technically look at it from the viewpoint of, well, my dad has all this experience with kind of casual Italian restaurants and you could go full bore into that. What is pushing you towards the more creative, um, fine dining end of the spectrum? For one, to me, it's just more interesting. There's more you can do Mm -hmm. with it. Like, with the molecular gastronomy ingredients that are out there, you can make food that, like, is more wow than more, oh, this is good. Like, you can get people, like, really interested or, like, really confused and about, like, what exactly they're eating. And it just is just kind of more fun to me than just making something that is potentially equally as tasty but less fun to eat. Like, I always would think if something's going to taste the exact same, like, on the deliciousness scale, I'm going to make that up. I would rather eat something that's more fun to eat than just boring to eat, but still, like, equally I can understand that. So um, have you had any, any meals that have kind of flicked that switch for you, or it's kind of just watching people's reactions to other chefs' dishes or... Uh, do, did you have a specific like there was that moment when I had you know like for me um, I mean eating some of the dishes that I had at a meal at Alinea was like oh my god because it's like you you read about this stuff and then you finally have the black truffle explosion dish and then you're like okay now I understand do you have any moments like that where you've or it's been kind of purely through research and what you're what you're seeing and reading about well I was was expecting that to happen when I went to Alinea. Mm -hmm. 
And it was not that experience for me. Really? I went there and I kind of mis like totally stupid and we had like three or four dishes that I like really wanted to have. And Alinea is kind of like that restaurant where they're like, we don't want a signature dish. We want things to change. Mm -hmm. And so I was, everything was very good, but like there was mm -hmm. nothing. But, like, nothing was, like, this. Sh I didn't have any of the dishes that were, like, that they were, like, really crazy. Like, I didn't have the black truffle mm -hmm. explosions or, like, the one where you eat off the table. Because those were all old Alinea dishes. Like, mm -hmm. they, they didn't mm -hmm. want to be known for that. And so I understand that. But, like, when I went there, their food was really good. But I, they didn't have any of the, for me, like... That blows me away. That's sad. I mean, sometimes it's like you set your expectations too high, and you. I mean, I've 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 definitely had meals like that where it's like I go into I go into an experience with so much hype, and so much expectation, and there's that's on that's on me as a diner, right? Because like, you can get this this aura of a place so overinflated, and then at the core of it, it's just kind of it's just food. It's just the way that it's presented is kind of, it can, with, especially with how knowledge gets distributed in these kind of very dramatic theatrical ways, whether it's photos that are very over the top or whether it's, you know, an episode of Chef's Table, you actually show up to the place and it's just lackluster. And that's the fault of me, the, 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 the person creating those expectations, as well as the media and the restaurant itself. Uh, not being real enough about their, you know, there, there's that fine balance of making sure that you're like being interesting enough to make sure people get interested in what you're doing, but at the same time, not creating false expectations. Um, so what are, who are, who are some chefs that you're paying attention to right now and, and where, where are you getting your inspiration from? I definitely get a lot of my, uh, inspiration from Grant Ackett's just, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's why it was very hard for me to, for my, for, with my experience at Alinea, because mm -hmm. I have, I take so much inspiration from him. Inspiration for, I mean, obviously, like, from Flynn McGarry, I think. Actually, I really like the way he does his food. I like what he's doing with vegetables, as in, like, instead of meat. Dr like, mm -hmm. he dry aged mm -hmm. a beet, and I thought that was really interesting. Right, so right. he's, like, doing a lot of the techniques that you don't see for vegetables that you see in meat. I think mm -hmm. also, like, just, I kind of said that before, but it's that's interesting to me. Um, I definitely like Massimo, Massimo Batura's stuff. Right. He, tell, he tries to tell a lot of a story with his food. I think that's pretty interesting. Right. Can you go back to his Grant being kind of, like, the biggest figure? What, what about it... Um... Because we, we share that, you and I, that Grant was also a very, very inspirational figure for me. The His Life on the Line book came out two days before I staged at Alinea. So I, re I read it from cover to cover in the airport on my way to stage at Alinea. So it was kind that's, of insane. That's crazy. That book <laughs> took me like three months to read. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. But, uh, but it, was re it was really good. Yeah, it was really inspiring. It was really cool to see. There's a lot of good nuggets in there. But maybe you can just tell me a little bit, because for me, a lot of it was, um, of course, his kind of perseverance and his fight through his disease that he had. But also it was kind of thinking differently, thinking creatively, not following the status quo, but also wanting to be extraordinary. That was definitely super, super inspiring for me. So maybe you can tell me a little bit more about why he's such an inspiration for you. Him being an inspiration for me really came as he was the first person who I saw doing Got it. molecular Got it. gastronomy kind of stuff. I mean, he mm -hmm. calls it progressive American, but uh, so that was like the first person I saw doing it. So he was just like... That was one of the reasons, and then I just kind of found his story and everything that he has, like, had to struggle through and everything that he's, like, overcome to me is really interesting, and then on top of that, his food is just, like, it's beautiful, it's interesting, 
he's doing stuff no one else has ever done before. And so all of that kind of adds together to be like, this guy is just really interesting. Right, right. So where are your sites set now? Uh, what is what is a, a, some initial steps that you're excited about doing in the in the very short term? And then maybe what what if you have any if you if you've set any kind of career goals that you have that would be like stupid crazy to achieve, if any. Maybe you can start with the short term. Yeah, I mean, short term, I would like to continue to stage at restaurants. I would like, like, stage at different restaurants, potential, like, this is sh- short term, like, long term, though, like, it's still technically short term, but it's, like, long term. I'd like to go, potentially travel mm-hmm. to a restaurant to do, like, a, like a week stage or a three days, st- like, something like mm-hmm. that. That would be something I'd like to do, like, kind of step up what I'm doing with the pop-ups, but on the long term, I don't really I have any idea what I want to do on the long term right sure, now. Sure, sure. Do you see it being a re- – I mean, I know you listen to my podcast. I know you hear, you, you hear me talk all the time about all the kind of different avenues that are available for chefs that are – you know, we, we are no longer tied down to the traditional restaurant model. Um. So that, but there isn't anything that's kind of caught your eye where you're like, I want a, you know, grill only restaurant on the coast of Portugal, right? Like, there's nothing like that that's hit you yet. Nothing like that. I mean, mm-hmm. I feel like I would want to do a restaurant as opposed to permanently doing mm-hmm. like pop ups. Mm-hmm. But I don't have anything like super specific. Got it. Got it. That's fine. I mean, it's you. You have the luxury of having so much time. I mean, I, I have no doubt that there's so many people listening that we were. I mean, what was I doing at 13? That's that's a good that's a good question. You're gonna get that as you as you continue to progress. When when you're 14 and 15 and 16 and 17, people are gonna say, "Well, you know, this is what I was doing when I was that age," and it's always constantly gonna be you know, saying that they didn't have it figured out yet. And there's frankly people who are 37 years old and don't have it figured out yet. So you have nothing but time. And I'm insanely happy to hear that everything is going so well with you. Let's talk about your stage. You just had a stage at a restaurant called Spoon and Stable. And I've kind of been one-on-one coaching you to help out with that through text messaging. But break down that experience for me. It was really cool. It was, it for one, I learned just how crazy it is that something as simple as like a peeled broccolini on a plate, how much prep that has to have done to have that. Like in a restaurant, like one person has to do that task for two Mm -hmm. hours to have each dish have the stems on a broccolini peeled. Like that was really kind of eye-opening to me is just the little things, how much work they are when you have to do them for however many diners eat at that restaurant on a Saturday mm-hmm. night. That, that was really interesting to me. So I did, I mean, this is very obvious as I was a stagiaire, but I mean, I did a lot of prep. And then as dinner service started, I went out and I got, I went to each and every station and I kind of observed and tasted components and just kind of saw what they were doing and how their station run. Did you uh, latch on to any specific station or an individual or kind of like, was there something that you, if you had the chance, like you, you may or may not be going back, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So if you, uh, if you go back and they kind of at the beginning of the day, say you can pair up with one person of your choice, who, who, who do you pick and why? Well, this was kind of, I would the most interesting station for me was Garmanger. Mo- that was mostly due to the fact that they had the most time to explain things to me. Mhm. Mhm. Cuz everything's cold, right? So they're not, yeah. you know, they're not worrying about sauté pans and burning oil. Yeah, so that was they had me taste the most things, they explained the most things. So that was the most that was the most fun that I had was at Garmanger station. And I, but I started at fish, and that was at the beginning. That was mm-hmm. at the beginning of service. And at the beginning of service, he, the guy at fish, did a really good job explaining too. But then I went back later in service, and he was like cooking three 
different things of each of, like, the four items he had, and it was, like, he was not explaining anything anymore because he was, like... Yeah. Yeah, you're in the weeds at that point. Yeah, totally. so... Yeah, I had the most fun at Garmage just because they had the most time to say, oh, this is why we're doing this. These are the components of this dish. And so that's why I liked that station the right. most. Was there any insight that you gained from kind of like that getting the stage experience? Because this was, this was your first stage ever, right? Yeah. Um, what were some insights that you had? Because I, I got a lot of flack when I was, you know, because I asked for my first stage when I was 18. And then I kind of got my first job out of culinary school at 20. And when you're 18, 19, 20, you're kind of just in that range where it's like you're I would I would argue I was worse off at that point than you are because you're at a point where you're young, but people just think it's so cool that you're interested in cooking that they're willing to give you all this information. When I was 19, 20 years old, it was kind of a place where I was too young to be taken seriously. But I was too old to kind of get that, like, um, original mentoring without kind of getting, uh, without at least proving myself in some way. Did you experience any of that? It seems like everyone was super nice to you, and you didn't really... Everyone was super nice, but then it was kind of like no one really, like, latched on and taught me anything super grand. Like, I I didn't walk away with, like, this... I learned something huge. But mm-hmm. that's yeah. just going to come with time. I mean that, that that's going to come with a couple more stages and I I know that you like what th- the whole reason that I'm excited to interview you and the the reason why I'm excited that we're becoming friends is because I know that I I you're not you're very well grounded. You aren't um you're you're humble. You are willing to take feedback and learn and you know that you're still growing um i feel like that's one of the reasons why flynn got a ton of flack because you know people thought he was this kind of know-it-all uh kid who was you know that's what everybody called him um but he did it right he got a ton of attention he got his experience he earned his stripes you know whether or not you think he did or not what are some other things that you're thinking about that you're kind of like because once it's the food part is one thing, but then there's other stuff that goes along with it. Is there any other kind of avenues that you're interested in right now, whether it's business or social media or TV or cookbook writing, or is it just, you're just focusing on the food right now? Mostly. I mean, to a certain extent, you have to kind of be interested in all of that. You have to, it's to be mm-hmm. thinking about it at least. And so but nothing, I haven't taken any, like, major steps in any of those ones that sure, you said. Sure, sure. Um, I know that you have a couple questions for me, and I know that was the one of, I, I literally made you not ask me them because I wanted to cover them here on the show. I know, so, I, had, I had so many, <laughs> so many questions that I was like, I should probably save this. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, maybe we can start with that. We'll do a little bit of rapid fire, and I'll do my typical deep dive that I normally do with rapid fire questions because I suck (laughs) at rapid fire questions. I mean, one of the ones that I've been talking to my dad about when we are planning these pop-ups is how do you know what to charge for, for like, Mm -hmm. for, Mm -hmm. that's something that I've had a hard time with because I don't really have a, I can't look and see what all the restaurants around me are charging because I'm not like, it's not like I have competitors or anything to look at like, it's hard for me because I'm the really the only person that is doing this, so it's like mm-hmm, I don't mm-hmm. know what to charge. So how do you right. go about plan uh, like figuring that out? Sure. So there's a couple avenues that you can look at. One is to, like you said, compare yourself with the other people in town or the other people that you're technically in direct competition with, and you can either do one of two things. You can either say you know, so-and-so's restaurant down the street is charging $100 for their tasting menu. I want to take their customers. I want to make sure that um, they it's a no-brainer. They're going to get a better experience, and it's going to be cheaper to come to me. So then you charge 90 bucks for it. And as long as it's economical to do that, you're not losing money, and it's allowing you to grow and get attention if you're in that stage of your kind of pop-up career— then it's smart to do that. 
The other route you can take if you're looking at other people's stuff is to say, I give a better experience and I'm going to charge more money, which is kind of flipping it on its head because, and this, and this, this relates to a lot of things with consumers and products is that it's not often the quality of the product. It is the price that you pay. And just by charging a higher price, you can be perceived as being a better product, which is all, it, 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 this, this all goes into the psychology of purchasing and, and, and all of that stuff. The other, another way that you can charge for your stuff is to do the kind of traditional, and they'll teach you this in culinary school if you end up going that route. And we can actually talk about that in a, in a little bit, but um, you can, do, you can calculate what your food cost is and because you have the luxury of you're doing it out of your house, yeah. right? The pop-ups. Okay. So because I mean, unless your parents decide that they want you to help pay the the rent or the mortgage, you don't have any rent costs associated with it. And if your parents are also helping you with staffing, like they're helping you run food and wash dishes and all of that and you're not hiring any extra people, um those all of those things go into factoring for what you're going to charge. Um, and it's all based on a percent, right? So a lot of people say that your food cost should be between 20 and 30%. So the easy way to figure that out is to just make it an even 25. You figure out exactly what you charged on, uh, exactly what you paid for in ingredients and then times it by four. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it's like, because it's 25%, you want to get it to a hundred percent. So you times it by four. And so, you know, say just hypothetically you spent $50 on all the ingredients for one person. And that's another thing that you have to, you have to just keep your receipts from everything that you bought from your last pop-up, uh, add that all together, divided by the number of people that you served. And that'll give you your cost per person. And then you multiply that times four. And that will kind of give you the traditional model of, uh, what you should be charging and what people will es- expect to at least pay, uh, comparing it to other restaurants. But the problem that you, you have with that is that people look at you and they're like, well, you're not paying any servers. You're not paying any rent. You're not paying, uh, to keep the lights on. You're not paying for paper towels. So kind of where, where is the rest of the money go? Because then you're technically making 75% profit after, after the whole yeah. thing's done. Which is great. Which is great if you're going to save and continue to invest in yourself, and um, whether that goes towards saving for culinary school or whatever. Um, the other route that you can go, which I've actually contemplated uh, going, is you can go polar opposite on either end of the spectrum. You can go completely super cheap, where it's like you're doing nine courses for like thirty bucks, and that's just covering your food cost. Uh, I'm contemplating doing an event like that and just filming the entire thing. Um, or you can just go completely the other way and charge, you know, like $300 for your event and just completely back it up with an amazing experience. And then there's no correlation between price. Yeah. Does that make sense? Where it's like an iPhone 10 is a thousand dollars and everybody knows that it only costs, you know, whatever it costs, like 150 bucks to make an iPhone. But the only reason that you can charge a thousand dollars for an iPhone 10 is because of the brand. Yeah, def- definitely. Right, and so, so that comes from building that brand and just being able to know that. Well, like when I go to a Spencer event, it's worth all three hundred dollars that I spend on it, just because that's the kind of event that he provides. And then it starts to transcend just the food, right? That's when we start to talk about these chefs that make you think completely differently about what food could it- be. Um, but that's 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 the short the short answer is is giving you just not not short answer but just giving you a couple different options and how you can think about pricing your events. Um, and I know because you don't have competition direct competition in town. Um, and I'm gonna a piece of advice that I, I actually am gonna give you that I've been thinking about with your stuff is that you should be charging uh, less for your events and building a community of yeah, people. So- and getting more content out is is what I is my is my kind of advice to you because even if you do make a profit, even if you can manage to turn it into something profitable, the gains that that money will get you are not as valuable as what you could get from things like awareness and just being just just letting people know that 
you are testing things, that you are learning through doing. That's really, really inspiring, and I feel like you could get people to come out based on that as opposed to getting them excited about the food that you're serving. Yeah, Does that so make sense? When you're talking about, like, building a brand, mm-hmm. what we have been doing right now for the pop-ups is kind of like a donation concept. That's right. You mentioned is, that, actually. So tell me a little so bit more about that. So originally, before we did it, it was going to be like a pay it forward. So my dad would cover the cost for the first one, and then whatever people decided to give would be the budget for the next one. We kind of mm-hmm. changed that concept into where it was, we, my dad would pay because we didn't, the people didn't pay in advance. And then what people paid would pretty much partially or completely pay back what we paid before. And so instead of it being pay it forward, it would be like pay it back. And then, Got it. so, Got it. but we learned two things out of that. Which is that, one, you should probably give people an example about how much it costs you to make. Right. Well, which, which which the way that you word that is a suggested donation. That's what yeah. they'll do at all of these kind of fundraisers. They'll say, like, you know, suggested donation is $50. And then that lets people know that kind of, like, don't don't be a scumbag and just give us 20 bucks because we're expecting a little bit more than that. And it just puts, yeah, it's 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 technically called, like, an anchor price. Yeah. Which gives people kind of like a frame of reference to like, okay, this is this is what I should be paying. But on the, on. Actually, on that $20 number, we did one of the dinners, and it was our second dinner, so we, we were still learning about like portion size, and our portion sizes were a little big, and we had filet and duck on, were the two proteins, and this guy paid 20 bucks. I mean, that's how it goes, dude. That's like, that's like the learning experience. I was like, I think we need to put... A suggested donation. And then the next one we did, my grandma invited people. And it was mm-hmm. like her dinner. And the people were like, we need to know how much we should be bringing. And then we were like, it's a donation. And then they're like, just give us a number. And that's when we said, well, this, the dinners take us $45 per person just to like put on. And that was, mm-hmm. and the the amount of do- like money we received from that dinner was so much higher than the ones we had gotten from the two ones and they were like oh wow people are paying so much money and they were like well actually this really isn't that much money compared to the amount of work we're actually doing to put on these things and sure sure. and so when i look at it they take 45 dollars to produce and even just like putting a cost at like 80 that's like it's not that it's what we should at least be making and it's still like it sounds expensive to me it's like i don't want to charge people that much and so but it Mm -hmm. was Mm -hmm. it was kind of like well actually maybe we should be charging like maybe that's how much we should actually be charging i mean it's it's a real thing with chefs that they really struggle with it's one of the reasons why uh the profit margins are so slim because we don't really think that what we do is that special as much as like what we have an ego we have an ego that goes along with it but there's some aspect of it that's just like you know i'm just cooking i'm just cooking it so you know how can i charge 16 dollars for a kale salad when the bunch of kale only cost me four dollars but it's real like you really have to charge that much money because otherwise you're going to go out of business and it's quite frankly how it's going to work but that's one of the reasons why uh I am pushing or at least advise you to do as far as like build the community and take as little money as you can to start. Obviously, don't run yourself uh, into debt or any or, you know, like make your parents angry. But there is a point when you need to it'll flip, right? It'll flip and then you'll 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 start to get more opportunities. And I mean, you you said it yourself. You're not going to be wanting to do pop ups forever. And you're going to, when is, when is the age when you can actually start working in a restaurant for you? Is it 16 or 18? I think it's 17. 17? Okay. That's, well, that's what, when I inquired about a stage at Spoon Stable, he said that they couldn't hire me under anyone under 17. So I'm right, going right. to go with 17. 17. Do you have plans to do culinary school in any aspect? I mean, it's still in the back of my mind, like, you should go, but I feel like if I'm starting now, I can get to a point where I've worked at enough restaurants where anything I learn in culinary school, like, I I could be totally wrong, 
and if so, correct mm-hmm. me. But I feel like mm-hmm. at that point, like what t- what age would you go to college at? Eighteen. So I graduated. Yeah. So I graduated high school when I was eighteen, and my culinary school started in November of that same year. So I was eighteen when I started culinary school, and I had even done I had even done a program in my high school that allowed me to start taking culinary courses while I was in my senior year of high school. So I started a culinary school, which was like a local tech college. And that started when I was 17. Yeah, so I mean, I, I looked at your, actually, your opinion on this, but I feel like I could learn potentially more in five years of staging at restaurants and doing pop-ups than I could in doing two or four years at a culinary school. And with staging and figuring out exactly what I wanted to do, I would like learn more specialized information for exactly what I wanted to do is what how I see it. Right. And I mean, I have a very unique op- opinion on this because it was exactly the same boat that I was in where it was I wanted the only my my sights were so clear. I was so focused that fine dining was what I wanted to do and I wanted a 3 Michelin star restaurant and I knew that what they taught in the culinary school that I went to, which was the Culinary Institute of America, did not match up with the economics of a michelin star restaurant they my school would teach you how to be an amazing hotel chef have this big operation and do court and do catering and banquets and and all that stuff but there was no match up to and all the other chefs that i admired you know like ferran didn't go to school and you know grant went to cia but he went for two years and and he actually had actually an interesting he kind of has the same opinion as you Right, he, where... Yeah, yeah, where it was like, he didn't really end up doing what he wanted, what he thought he would be mm-hmm, doing. Mm-hmm. And because he did the wine thing for a little while while he was in school. But anyways, uh, I, I, you're not wrong. To say that you can learn more in five years of staging and doing pop-ups than you would in culinary school is absolutely true. The fact that I am just now coming to grips with what it's like to price my food and write my own menus and all of that is absolutely something that like the fact that you and I are having this conversation right now means you're already light years ahead of where a lot of people end up getting. The thing that I gained that I would advise you to go to culinary school for is the network and the ability to work with teams. Yeah, you talk in your videos, you talk a lot about the network created by going to like CIA, the, the people you 100%. Meet. It's super valuable. But again, again, if staging at Spoon and Stable can get you access to staging at Danielle or Jean George or per se, you know, like if, if, if that is your network, then 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 it's irrelevant you know like whatever uh, network you could have gotten in culinary school is irrelevant if if the opportunities that you desire are satisfied by the the professional network you already have through your stages the other thing and this is again super important is that working with other people aspect that you really get used to doing in school you're constantly paired up you get put on stations with different people. Your kitchen setups that you're in are, are constantly changing. And you really learn how to work with other people and whether or not that's a strength of yours or a huge weakness. And it's absolutely necessary. But again, if you can get that experience staging, you should 100% do that. I just fear that there are going to be pieces that are missing from your repertoire if you don't do school or if you don't have an education or if you know if you were to tell me right now that you had ambitions to own a restaurant group if you wanted to be the next Danny Meyer I would 100% tell you to go to school but because you're like me and you want to cook creative food and you want to work for the best and you want to continue to push yourself I don't at minimum you need to if you're going to do school don't do four years do two years and get as much real world experience as you can. At least that's my advice. Do what you did, stage on the weekends. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm, 100%. Like, do what you need to do to get that baseline experience. And also, don't get too caught up with. There's going to become a point when you need to prove yourself. And proving yourself can either be how do you manage people? It can be, I need you to write a menu. It can be, I need you to cook for a hundred people and, you know, do it all by yourself. It can be like, for me, it was working a garnish station 
it was like working in Entremet station. And it was the first point when I was like, oh man, this happened when I moved to Norway. It was like, I had French laundry, I had per se, I had grace on my resume, but I didn't know how to glaze vegetables. And it's like, when you hit that point, then you'd really need to level up. Um, whatever you can do to mitigate those experiences for you. Um, and that just comes from sucking all you can out of every single restaurant experience that you have, whether it's a stage or whatever. And that comes from an asking the right questions and all that. I don't think you have to go to school. I, I mean, I, I do need to make a full, is culinary school worth it? style video because I do have a lot of strong opinion opinions I do have a lot of strong opinions you on definitely it definitely should but do uh that. yeah I it's it's just interesting for me to hear your perspective on it maybe you what 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 are some other questions that you have for me I mean one of the things that I actually have been thinking about recently is I can't there's only a certain amount of volume I can do in my house for pop-ups that's actually where I, like, I kind of consulted Flynn and how mm -hmm. he did it Meaning he actually was able to, he had hardwood floors so he could put tables in everywhere in his house, which mm -hmm. I can't do because we totally have carpet everywhere. What do you do to, a, like, A, find a pop-up space and, like, like where mm -hmm. should I look to kind of expand or what to do next mm -hmm. when I start getting bored of six-person pop-ups in my dining room? I mean, we can do seven, but... Mm -hmm. definitely seven is mo the most it's, that we can yeah do. cozy seven is cozy okay um i would say don't again this goes back to the kind of economics of it if you you have to be doing it for the right reasons right you have to be expanding because you want to push yourself to see if you can do more people not because because you're not going to gain you would gain you would gain more by reaching out to every single tiny newspaper and blogger and famous mom in your tiny town and letting them know that you're doing these dinner events and inviting them to your dinner events and having them post on the internet somewhere about there's this kid Spencer doing five course tasting menus. That would bring you infinitely more awareness and reputability than doubling the size so that you can serve 12 people at an event. Now, if you're interested in just getting better at cooking for more people, that might be worth it. And then you should explore something like either renting an Airbnb space, which again, your parents are going to have to help you with, and you need to get in touch with the Airbnb host and tell them that you're going to be throwing a private dinner party that's very important that you tell them a private dinner party because that's important that you disclose to them. Otherwise, they can. There's some like terms in the contract that they'll yell at you for. But yeah, that 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 would be my advice. Is I would focus on the six. Make sure that you can do six plates of each dish. Perfect. You know, just focus on that because in a real restaurant environment, there's like the most you're gonna plate up at a time is like ten. Like after ten, it's just. The whoever's expediting, especially in a fine dining situation, should just break it up into more uh, pickups. So if you can get plating six dishes at a time down and executing them well and making sure that every single plate is something that you're happy with serving however many people you're serving, that's only going to help you because it gets like you, you read about it all the time where there's, the, there's these sushi counters in a subway station of Tokyo and they only have like seven seats right like that's it's that exclusivity that adds another element to it so for you I see it being nothing a, a, as an advantage having less people uh, but really focusing on your craft and building your craft and making sure that just the right people are showing up to your events if awareness is what you're interested in does that make sense yeah so like thinking about if I wanted to do more like thinking about potentially doing more courses then instead of more people a hundred percent yeah you should you should not get crazy by ruining the menu by doing a 17 course menu you know how 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 menus can be like that sometimes where it's just like there's too many courses and you don't even remember what you ate at the end of the at the end of the meal it was just too much and you're not really putting your heart into every single dish yeah i mean like experiment with what i mean you you even had a question to me the other day about what like i need to add a dish to my menu start to play around with that like what does an eight course menu for you look like that's what you should be playing around with as opposed to doing more people because if you get these right people the right people coming to your events and they're seeing that you're able to pull this off in a way that impresses them 
you're going to have that mom, that Minnesota mom who has a dinner party coming up at her house and she's going to ask you just to cook for yeah, it. When and we... it's going to be, it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be 10 or 12 people. And that's going to be perfect because then she's going to give you liberty with the menu. She's going to tell you that she, she just wants you to cook something great. And she's just going to get a kick out of telling everybody that she's having a private chef who's 13 cater her menu. We, we had that you know? ha- actually happen when we did the, the <laughs> first one. It mm-hmm. was very that's exactly it what you want. It was very disappointing That's exactly because what you it, want. Fell, it fell through because they were like currently, uh, I don't remember what happened, but it fell through. But it happened on the first one, which was, mm-hmm. so I mean, I think that you've, you've got a point there with the right kind of people. And Yep, because that's what it comes down to at, at a certain point is just awareness. Let people know exactly what you're doing and, and what you're up to and what your what your brand is and exactly what, what it is that you stand for and what getting people to appreciate the work that you do is basically the goal. I know I have, have been reading lots of books. You have a book that you've been or been or have read that you found particularly inspiring or, or helpful. There has been a couple that have shaped my personality on the business side and this um this isn't cooking stuff at, at, at the mo- at the at a, at a certain level because and this is why I've been become such a fan of the kind of like it's just food kind of phrase lately just because I see a lot of people obsessing over um flavors and technique and but their people skills are just so bad <laughs> and it's just really depressing to see people that are either so talented or see people that are incredibly emotionally intelligent but can't managed to be successful in a kitchen. So a lot of the books that have been most form- formative for me have been not cooking related books at all. There's a great book by this guy named Ryan Holiday uh, and it's called Ego is the Enemy. I'm actually uh, writing an article about what chefs can learn from that book because it is so important, especially in this industry where there are so many egos running around. But on the cooking side of things, I'm, I'm looking at my shelf right now there's a the the astronauts book do you have that one that one was really good because it goes very much into that realm that you and i are both interested where uh pascal barbeau is there every night he's cooking everything for everybody he has like a line of three other cooks who are all ex michelin cooks it's really really hard to get in magnus nielsen from favikin used to be a line cook there and he just talks And it's just all over the place. His writing is just all over the place. He'll be talking to you about crab and how it's just like this succulent, sweet crab. And then he'll be like, oh, and the citrus. It's like all translated from French. But it's a really, really interesting read of like a chef's mind just going through dishes and what he thinks about food. The other one that was really formative for me was the Favikin book. It's really good because he's very opinionated <laughs> on the way that he does things. He's like, if you're going to make a chicken stock, why would you put onions in your chicken stock? Because then it's a chicken and onion stock. A chicken stock should just be chicken bones, and that's it. So that's all stuff that, you know, like, I really enjoyed. The Modernist Cuisine book was also really interesting. I read that book from cover to cover when I was in culinary school. All five books, cover to cover. I took notes on it. I have a notebook full of all of the notes. It is, that was also really formative for me because when I was in school, I was all about debunking all of these things that my stu- that, that my teachers were telling me. You know, like, you have to start a chicken stock with cold water. And I'm like, Why? I you actually, I mean? like, with that particular <laughs> one, I did it because Thomas Keller told me to do it, and I've literally, every time mm-hmm. I go to make a chicken stock, I'm like, I have no idea why I'm doing this. It seems like I am just, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. if I'm going to heat it up, why do I have to start with cold water? Yep. It just doesn't and make those sense. And those are questions that your generation should be asking, and it's like, it's one of the reasons I'm preaching so hard for education and and thinking of things differently. And because there was a some some dude did a seminar at my culinary school where he talked all about the it, it, there's no there's zero relation between a higher quality chicken stock and the temperature of the water that you started at. There's just zero relation to it. So I love that. I love to debunking those myths. You know, like it, it extends further into the cookbooks that I'm reading right now, right? Where it's like Christina Tosi talked all about tempering your eggs is pointless and sifting flour is useless and all of these other things that it's like just the way that you said it, 
you know, it's like I do it because Thomas Keller said that was the best way to do it. Is <laughs> like there, if there's no science behind it and there's you're not actually producing a good product. It's one of the reasons why I'm such a big, uh, a, a horrible... I hate the way the the phrase the proper way to do something because the 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 quote unquote proper way to do something is just the way that you do it and that's all that it is it's just the way like if you told me if Spencer told Justin I'm going to make a you're not you, you need to make a mayo the proper way you're basically telling me that the way that you make it is the proper way to do it or the way that you enjoy doing it it's just it's just uh, things that you should be thinking about is any any uh, th- those those were books that I found interesting during my time in 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 my education was any book that myth busted I loved that book yeah but those are my those are my few it was Modernist Cuisine uh, the Lestrance book obviously the French Laundry book the Favikin yep and then outside of that Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday was really good what else was really really formative for me as I was growing up there was this other book called uh How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Car- Carnegie that really helped me with things like my stagiaire email template that really helped me r- uh, write that in a way that made sense and it also helped me make friends in the kitchen because that's what it that's what this industry is about is relationships so emotional intelligence and being able to talk to people uh, a lot of it is kind of like figuring out how you can bring value to other people and it's like the easiest way to make friends with someone is to ask them questions about themselves and because then they think they they have this in their head that they that you have an interest in in what their interests are and there's just a bunch of fascinating things that Every single person in this industry should be reading just as much about relationships and emotional intelligence, that kind of stuff, as they are about how to sous vide duck at the proper temperature. Because it's just as important, right? Like, you said it yourself that you can't do pop-ups just by yourself. So there's zero, there's zero, there's so much value in being able to work with other people. And you're going to hit that point in your career where you need to manage other people. It's just to have those skills to be ready to take on that responsibility is just so invaluable. And no one can teach you that. No one is born a leader or a manager. It's all it's all learned, yeah. which is the great, the great news is that it can all be learned and it can all be taught. You just need to seek it out and it needs to be part of your, uh, part of what you're interested in. Yeah, definitely. I am currently, uh, Working my way through uh, Daniel Balud's letters to a young chef, which has been oh yeah, that was yeah super super important. There's a really good line in there that's you can quote me if you know it better than I do, but it's something along the lines of like you'll learn more cleaning lobster at a three Michelin star restaurant than you will cooking on the grill at a country club or it was, whatever. It was that making line is. a salad. Uh huh. It's totally true. It's totally true. I mean, like, you could have gone and worked with your dad's friend at the Italian place and learned how to make pizza and spaghetti bolognese, or you can make friends with the Garmage dude at Spoon and Stable. Yeah. It's way more valuable. It's way more valuable. Just, like, if you have something that you're interested in, like, go sit next to it, right? Like, get as close to the sun as you can. That's, like, the best. And I'm, 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 I'm proud of you for seeking that experience out yeah and doing it. there was another line in that book which was actually really similar to what you have like experienced and it was like you might go to a restaurant and have all these restaurants on your resume and think that you're just like the best and mm-hmm. think that you're like hot stuff which is what the book says and he's like take my word for it you're not yep it's totally true. I mean, there there's no shortage of that in this in this industry. And the problem is the society fuels it, right? Like there was so many people in from Turkey and uh, the Czech Republic and India at Noma when I was there, when I was staging at Noma. And they were there just so that they could say that they just so they can put Noma on their menu because they go home to wherever they are and say that they worked at Noma and investors starting are starting to want to write them checks and they can get that job at that restaurant that they couldn't get before just from a simple line on your resume that says that you spent time at this restaurant and it it I am the perfect example of it that it does not equate to being a better chef a better line cook a better uh, hospitality professional 
just because you worked somewhere doesn't matter. It, it truly doesn't matter. But on the flip side, on the flip side, people can say whatever they want about the restaurant that I worked at in Norway. I learned more at that restaurant about technique, about managing, about running a restaurant than any of the other restaurants that I worked at, whether it's Per Se or French Laundry or Grace or wherever. That is my test. I mean, that's my test for people is to just like, I'll cook with you. Like, let's cook together and then we'll actually see, you know, what you're made of. And that's what it comes down to. That book has just got a lot of things that you might think this, but it's actually like you're mm-hmm. wrong. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the, <laughs> the beauty of it is the, the culinary field is so weird because there's so many it's like such a weird hodgepodge of other industries right like it's kind of like being a musician and it's kind of like being an athlete and it's kind of like being in the army uh, all at the same time and a lot of it is shrouded in mystery and a lot of it is kind of too screwed up for anybody to actually tell anybody about it you kind of have to experience it for yourself but it's just a fascinating industry at least for me from the years that I've spent in it. Where can people find out about your dinner events and learn more about you? Um, on we have we just ha- got an Instagram, so the diner or yeah, the diner underscore mn is our Instagram. I'll probably get like I'll probably try to make a website for that as I start get as, as it starts getting more serious. Mm-hmm. So that is it mm-hmm. right now. And you're on you're on Instagram We're, yourself, and you're on Twitter, right? Yeah. I'm going to leave all of that yeah. in the show notes for everybody that's interested. Is there any chance we can uh, talk about some news, like kind of the stuff you cover? Oh, totally. Your... Is there some stories that you're interested in? Uh... Have you... Oh, actually, see. I have actually a couple things, and then I have one thing that I want to ask yeah, if you've seen. For sure, for sure. Have you, see... have you seen the new Noma? Yet? I haven't seen any photos of the new Noma. Oh, it's cr- you have to. Let, it's I'm gonna. I'm, I'm at my computer now. I'm gonna look it up right now. But keep 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 going with other stories that you're. Yeah, I've been. I felt I've been looking actually just kind of more on Noma. I've been looking at their Instagram and mm-hmm, mm-hmm. they kind of actually did like what you were supposed to have at Grace with the basement. Oh yeah. The they were calling it a, the staff canteen. Don't know what that means, but they have this room where they're like gonna eat family meal, and they have people like in there on their computers like researching, and that was just like I thought of you instantly when I saw that because it was just like that's what Justin talks about how he was supposed to have at Grace. Totally. So the thing that actually existed at the old Noma space, which was amazing. So oh, they I had, did. um, yeah. So they had a fantastic kind of. It was all the cookbooks that you could imagine. Every single book, like if it's come out from any country in the world, it was on the shelves. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. that's where the test kitchen was. Um, not to be confused with the Nordic Food Lab, which was actually across the street. They actually had a test kitchen in that area, uh, where there would be between one and three chefs that would work on different things. And yeah, exactly like you said, there was computers. Everybody ate staff meal there. It was amazing. It was definitely one of the reasons why Noma attracted so many people and why it continued to push the way that it did. And be and cook creatively in that way. Noma is definitely that they during great. They just have mm-hmm. done everything. Are right. you? Did you see photos on their Instagram? Is that where you were? I'm. Uh, it's high on my list to go back to Noma. I would definitely want to go during their seafood season, which I think is right now during the winter. Um, just because it's something that I'm insanely passionate about and i have no doubt there would there would be a lot of product from norway served in that dinner what are some other news stories that you've been keeping an eye on i think we talked about this a little bit but uh i think you you do see the art of plating that recipe book uh no let's uh let me pull that up oh, art of plating yeah. recipe book i think i've seen do this you follow before. them on instagram i don't follow them on instagram anymore i have cut out a lot of silly silly i mean it, i get a lot of value from art of plating Absolutely. However, there is a lot of stuff that happens with them. The The problem I have with Art of Plating and all of these places that post food photos is a lot of it is kind of one. It's really easy to make a dish look good once. That's my issue with a lot of these uh, accounts that just make beautiful food. A lot of it doesn't eat well. That was something that I really learned at the restaurant in Norway is that you can make it look great, but how does it affect the guest experience? Like, how does it get into that person's mouth in a way that actually makes sense? Yeah. 
You've, um, got, you've got a point there. Just something that's interesting that I've been thinking about, you know, because you can make something look insanely beautiful, but again, if you if it shows up at that person's table with dried out sauce or um, they don't know how to eat it, it's completely lost, and then it just becomes a pure ego thing. So I'm am I looking at the right thing? It says uh, art of plating times mishmash recipe notebooks. Yeah, I think with that. a waterproof case. Yeah, that's cool. What do you like about it? Just the fact that it's uh has those organized tabs. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's what you you talked about the address book. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. does this have? I is this alphabeticalized? Yeah. Or? So no. So this one has tabs. It looks like so it says uh, each recipe can be personalized by rating, category, uh, difficulty, and cooking process, making it your go-to guide while cooking. And it comes in a waterproof case, so it doesn't get any uh, mess on it, apparently. But what if it's not in the case? Yeah, that's number one. I mean, it's like, that was why the Modernist Cuisine Kitchen Manual was so great, because the pages were, like, laminated. That, I was, thought that was Mm -hmm. so cool, that they did their kitchen version, because I, now I have, like, my French laundry yeah, book is gross just splattered because... with sauce and whatever. I totally, I, I feel you, man. I'm, I'm right there with you. It's like they make these coffee table books, but then again, you want to use mm-hmm. them. And then you're like, this feels weird putting this big, beautiful book on the kitchen table. And exactly. Like... Well, that's the that's the fight, right? Because people, uh, the, the book publisher knows that they will make more money in a bigger market selling coffee table books, but the chef knows that what they're interested in is sharing their ideas through the food. And so it's a constant fight, at least from what I've heard about with cook- with cookbooks. And I've, I've only done a limited amount of recipe testing for cookbooks before, but uh, it's really fascinating. But uh, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to reach out to them and see if they'll send me a notebook. Uh, I, have, I have one to show you, actually. If you go on Instagram and check out uh, Stone, are you familiar with their stuff? I am not. Stone Stone Notebook. Search that on Instagram. Yeah, so it's uh, Instagram.com slash Stone Notebook. S-T-O-N-E-N-O-T-E-B-O-O-K. You should look at that. Oh, okay. I, fa- I found that. Yep. So you should definitely look at this. I've reached out to them to try to get, to try to get a uh, notebook. It's really, really interesting what they're doing. Uh, they're all kind of personalized, and they're made for chefs. Oh, that's really cool. In in their yeah, in cool. their own unique way, yep. So they have an area to sketch dishes, to write, to do recipe conversions. It's waterproof paper and vegan leather, yep. So I've reached out to them. I've tried to get a copy of their stuff. I haven't heard back from them, but I'd be interested to try their stuff out. I think their uh, notebook's only f- available new. for pre-order, but I've gotten advertised to them a few times. Yeah, brand new. So they're only available for pre-order right now, but it's something that I'm keeping my eye on. How are you organizing your recipes right now? I have not done a whole lot of design, like actually creating that celery act mm-hmm. dish that you helped me with was my first one that I've But done. even like the recipes that you're getting from cookbooks, are you writing them down anywhere or keeping track of them? I should probably start doing that, but no, I'm currently just Yeah, using... that's something that I didn't do early enough. You should get a way that you feel comfortable accessing and a way that you can keep it organized uh, because it's something that comes in insanely valuable as you progress because... That's where that's what it comes down to. You can have all the ideas in the world, but if you can't execute it or more importantly, communicate it to somebody else how you want something done, then it becomes an insane time suck if you don't have all your stuff written down in a way that's accessible. Yeah, and when you t- when you did your uh like five more things in like it was like the mm-hmm. addition to your stage mm-hmm. video and the b- ability to like search through Google Drive, that's really cool. Google Drive is the move. If you don't do Google Drive, the other way that I would recommend is to do Evernote. Are you familiar with that app? I have kind of, like, I mean, I've heard of it and I think I've installed it and then uninstalled it before. Yeah, Evernote is really good because you can search uh, not just r- the text that you type, but you can also, um, it has, the software will search through photos as well. I haven't played around with that yet, but I was actually re... No, I mean, like, just even Google Photos mm-hmm, now, it's mm-hmm. so yeah, it's amazing how smart. their recognition, their recognition, and it's, like, not even, like, you can do it and it 
might work. It's like works a hundred percent, and it's pretty crazy. There, I mean, that's the recognition that's, of it. Yep, that's where Google is screwing everybody else over, is because their software is so good between their assistant and their search functions. It's crazy. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. If you've made it this far in the interview, hopefully there was a nugget or two in there that you can take away. Definitely keep up with Spencer on the interwebs. Ask him any questions you might have on Instagram, because I would love to have this be the first interview with the next up-and-coming young chef. I would just love that as a legacy play for me. This is the, also the first interview I did with one of you. If you um, enjoyed it, I think this would be a format I would like to explore a little more going forward, just because the Q&A aspect is really nice when it's one-on-one, and you guys can be really specific. Plus, we can get a few different perspectives on industry stories. Uh, my next interview is going to be with Galen from Town Cutler. They really enjoyed the video I did on that knife that I bought from them. So him and I are going to be chatting next. There isn't a defined date for it yet, but if you're interested in learning about what it takes to go from sous chef at Quince to owning your own badass knife shop, hit me up on Twitter at Justin underscore Kana and hashtag the emulsion. I will be sure to find you and your questions. Thank you to everyone on Patreon that supports this show and all the content that I do. If you're willing and able to do that, I would really appreciate it. You can do that over at patreon.com slash Justin Kana. I just finished my Aero Press of Stumptown Ethiopian Guji. That is today's beverage. This was episode 53 of The Emulsion. My name is Justin Kana. Have a good one. The comment section is never good. The comment section on the internet is never good, except for my videos sometimes because I'm really, I'm really stuck picky with my comment section i will block people if they're negative in any yeah dude like i i don't i don't stand for that stuff like if you're gonna be negative or if you're gonna be like try to be a troll on the internet it's just like it's not worth my time it's not like i have i've spent all this energy building this community and if you're gonna cut it it, i I equate it to coming into my house with muddy shoes and stomping all over my carpet it's it's just 100 percent not worth it (laughs) i had this dude comment the other day. I'm going to read it. It's from my Victoria Knox video. He says, so quote, I don't like the box. And even if it is a really good knife, it's cheap. And I like expensive things end quote. And then he says, you are really, wow. You are really lame. He was trying to be savage. And I gave him some passive aggressive comment back, but I'm a, I'm a hundred percent with that. I, I want, I want anybody to be a hundred percent comfortable doing anything in the comment section and not being judged, and not being hated, and not being critiqued in a bad way. That's all I care about in my comment section.